So uh, this is a problem that uh, I, I want to start with uh, a sort of discussion of background, and then later on I'll get on to what we did on tournament. Let me start with uh, with uh, you know, well-known results. So first of all, there's Ramsey's theorem. The Ramsey's theorem says. Uh, That if uh, if G has n vertices, an undirected graph, then um, I'm using notation from earlier. There's the maximum size of a clique and the maximum size of a stable set. So omega G means the max size of a clique. Oh, I shouldn't write it there. Let's define omega g as the max clique size, and alpha g is the max stable set size. Then Ramsey's theorem says one of alpha g and omega g is big. But not very big. It's only log n. It's constant, constant times log n. Um, that's uh, and that's more or less, that's more or less the truth. For the right constant, that's the truth. Now things change if you forbid a subgraph. So, for instance, if we if we look at graphs not containing We look at graphs not containing, say, a triangle. Well, then omega g is certainly very small. But uh, alpha g is suddenly a lot bigger. Alpha g is now order of n squared. Well, there's order of n squared log n. This is, uh, this is John Hans' theorem. Square root. Uh, oh, I mean, uh, sorry, square root. I'm ignoring the log n term. So, if you don't contain a triangle, then alpha is not log anymore, it's, uh, it's uh, n to the half. Or similarly, if you look at graphs, say, not containing this, what are graphs that don't contain? What do I mean by contain? Contain means in contain as an induced subgraph. If you look at graphs, just restrict yourself to graphs not containing this as an induced subgraph. Well, they're very simple graphs. Every component is a clique. If, you had a, if here's a connected subgraph and it has two non-adjacent vertices, there's the shortest path between them. That's an induced subgraph and its length at least two. So you contain it. So every component has to be a clique if you don't contain that. And then either one of the cliques is big or you have many cliques and that gives you a big stable set. So in that case, the max of alpha g and omega g is at least n to the half. Or if you look at graphs not containing this, actually the same thing happens. It's not quite so obvious, but it's still true. The max of alpha g and omega g is at least n to the half. That's because any graph not containing this, well, what, one reason is any graph not containing this is perfect. And that's, that's not hard. And for any perfect graph, either there's a big clique or the chromatic number is small. And if the chromatic number is small, you get a big stable set because of some color class is big. So, um, and uh, for other special graphs, if you exclude them, something similar happens. So, for instance, if you exclude the claw, then max of alpha g, omega g is, is at least n to the third. It's order of n to the third. I don't know what the constant is in the front. Or if you exclude the bull, 
Um, this Manx, well, it's not into the third anymore, but it's at least into the quarter. This is, a, this is, this is not getting harder. This is the theorem of Chodnowski and Safra. Um, so maybe there's a pattern. Maybe whenever you exclude any graph, suddenly this max is not log. Any, I mean, Ramsey, Ramsey theorem just gave you log. But maybe if you exclude, if you look at for any fixed graph, if you just restrict yourself to graphs not containing that fixed graph, then you either then you get a much then the max of alpha and omega is much bigger, and that's the erdos heinel conjecture. And that was um, 1989. That for every fixed graph, there exists constants, there exists a C and an epsilon such that every graph not containing, such that for every graph, not containing H, the max of alpha G and omega G is at least the size of the graph to epsilon. Uh, C. Right, so it's just a an attempt to generalize what's happening here. For, for each of these particular graphs, you've suddenly got, uh, did I say, uh, and G is supposed to have n vertices here. I forgot to say that, I think, but G has n vertices. Anyway, it's an attempt to capture that. Um, it's a nice general conjecture. And it's a statement about what happens whenever you exclude any graph, any fixed graph as an induced subgraph. Now, there are not many conjectures or theorems like that. In fact, I don't think, I, I mean, if you ask me to list them, I don't think I could list any. I mean, I think, but this is some statement you can make in general about what happens when you, ex some, some big change that happens when you exclude a fixed induced subgraph. It's like, if, you know, when you exclude a, a fixed minor, you suddenly get bounded genus or tree structures of graphs of bounded genus. It's a big change from being a general graph. But when you exclude something as a fixed induced subgraph, the effect is much, you get much less of an effect. And this is, this is uh, one of the, well, it's the only thing I know that you can, that uh, is conjectured to follow from excluding an, an induced subgraph. Uh, but it's open. Anyway, uh, so, but it's a nice problem. And so you try to see what other graphs you can prove it for prove for these things. You can prove it, whenever you can prove it for a graph, you can prove it for the complement of that graph. Right? And if it's true for a graph, it's true for a complement, because in the, what's the conclusion? The conclu if I, when I go to the complement, it just switches alpha and omega. So graphs not, con if I know it for not containing that, I also know it for not containing this. So I can add that to my list. And uh, then still you're pretty much stuck. I mean, for special graphs, you don't get a whole lot further. There's, there's one general theorem that's uh, due to Alan Bach Solomoshi. In 2001. It says the following. So, suppose you have these graphs satisfy the conjecture. Let's, let's call these graphs with the erdos heinel property. These are graphs with the erdos heinel property. Right? Meaning graphs for which the conjecture is true. So here's a way you can make a bigger graph out of two smaller graphs. You substitute one graph for a vertex of the other. So you take a, you take some graph, again. here's a graph 
And here's a vertex of it. This is its neighbor set, and that's its non-neighbors. Let me draw a better picture. Right. Here's a graph. Here's a vertex of it. Here are its neighbors. Here's another graph. So some other graph. Then I can substitute this for that vertex. What it means is I take the left-hand part, and I take this thing, and whatever that is, and whatever this was joined to, I make all of these joined to all of those. Is it, is it clear what, a, what I mean? I'm substituting a, one graph for a vertex of another graph. So if we call this one A, we call this one B, then this part is this part is A with the vertex V deleted, and this part is still B. And that's that's what became of the vertex V. Is it is that is that clear? That uh, well, what Alan Park Solomonshi proved is that if A and B have the Erdős-Einel property. then so does what you get by substituting, if I call this thing C. Right? If you substitute, if you have two graphs with a property and you substitute one for a vertex of another, then again you have the property. Um, and I guess there's a special case of that, the taking disjoint union works. If this graph has the property and that graph has the property, then the disjoint union works. Um, I guess, I'm not sure if that's a special case of this or not, but that's another theorem. You can take disjoint unions. Well, so that gives, that at least enables us to make our list a bit bigger. We can start substituting some of these for vertices of others, and uh, you get more graphs which have the property. But you don't get very far. I mean, you get more graphs, but it's still very sparse. And that's the complete list. That's the entire list of all graphs that the erdos heinel property is known to hold for. So, it's only for, well, the graphs I listed here and the graphs you can get from them by substituting. Again, these in this column and the things you can get from such. And even these are not, you can d delete some. Like this one has got by, it's a, it's, if you look at its complement, the complement is not connected. So this, this one you can construct from two smaller graphs if, I, if you believe in taking complements and you believe in taking disjoint union. So I don't even need to mention that one. And this one is the same. The complement is not connected, so I don't even need to mention it. This one's the same. Any clique is the same. So they're all special cases of this taking disjoint union theorem and, the, and substitution. This one's not, and this one's not. This one goes away. But really, there are just two building blocks, that guy and that guy. Even when you take complements, this is the complement of itself, and that's the complement of itself. Those are the, basically the only graphs it's known for, apart from what you get by substitution. Which is not very good, right? I mean, it's a nice conjecture. A lot of people thought about it. And if it doesn't, you don't get further. So in particular, it's open does this graph have the erdos heinel property? One does C5. Those things are open. Um, anyway, so that's a little sad. I mean, it's a beautiful conjecture, and yet we don't seem to be able to prove it for any other graph. We've been stuck since 2002. Well, I guess the chudnovsky safra result was more recent, but, uh, but it's very slow progress on that. Now, um, What happens 
Jones. Right, there was another thing I wanted to say, just I forgot what it was. So there's an equivalent version, there's an equivalent formulation of the Erdős Einhorn conjecture that was that was proved equivalent by uh, Alan Park Solomon. And that's for coloring tournaments. So we, you know what a tournament is and you know what coloring it is mean. Uh, again, a tournament is uh, tournament means you take a you take a you chalk that works. <laughs> There's something wrong with that tool. Let me try again. The tournament is. <laughs> uh, I'm not doing well. Um, okay. Hold on. It's got to be chalk. Okay, I'm multiplying now. Agree? Okay, the tournament is you take a complete graph. I, mean, I should just tell you. But you, and you put arrows on the edges. <laughs> Somehow. You take a complete graph and you direct its edges. And coloring a tournament just means you partition the vertex set into acyclic subgraphs. An acyclic subgraph of a tournament is a special structure. It means an acyclic subset means it can be ordered so that all the edges go from left to right. Well, that's always true for any acyclic subgraph. But in a, in a tournament, you know, all the edges are present. So the chromatic number of a, a tournament just means the minimum number of acyclic subgraphs subsets with union the whole vertex set. Um, and let's go, so this is from Boyan's talk. Uh, but even before that, we could think about the largest, let's think about the largest acyclic subgraph. Given a tournament, let's think about its largest acyclic subgraph. Let me just write alpha g means the largest, the maximum acyclic subgraph. Uh, I don't know if I'm calling my tournament T or G. I should try and be consistent for you. Now, well, you can do the same. Let me leave that there for the moment. Once again, you get a Ramsey theorem, an analog of Ramsey, that says if every every n, n vertex tournament tournament has T has a transitive subset of the size at least constant log T log n, if it's got n vertices. And in fact, I don't even need a constant here. If I do logs to base 2, this is true. Um, and that's more or less the truth, that uh, you can give tournaments where this is at most, I think, 2 log 2. Is that what, Boyan, did you prove that? I mean, did you prove that 10 minutes ago? OK, that's what I thought you proved. That's good. So there exist tournaments such that Alpha t is almost two, twice that, and so that's that's pr pretty accurate. So log n is the answer, but once again you get an analog of the erdos heinel conjecture. So we can here's another erdos heinel conjecture. That for every tournament h there exists cons constants C and epsilon such that for every tournament T not containing H uh, 
alpha t is at least the number of vertices of t raised to the power of epsilon. C times the number of vertices of t raised to the power of epsilon. Um, so it's just analogous to this. One nice thing about that formulation is you don't have alpha and omega. You just, you just want to look at the biggest acyclic subgraph. It's a little easier. Um, this is actually equivalent to that. These are equivalent. And that's the theorem of Valon Park Solomoshi. This one is true for all graphs H, if and only if that one is true for all tournaments H. And if you just know this for one particular graph, it doesn't tell you anything for there. But if you know this for all graphs, then you also know that for all graphs and vice versa. So, you know, with the, with the, when we were trying to do special cases of the erdos heinel property, you know, it's a nice general conjecture, but we didn't get very far doing special cases. What happens if we try to do special cases of the erdos heinel conjecture for tournaments? I mean, we don't expect to do it for all tournaments because that's equivalent to the graph problem. But maybe special cases will be more fun. And that's, the, that's uh, one thing I want to talk about. Well, once again, you can do, you can prove the analog of the Allen Park Solomonshi theorem. That if A, if here's a tournament, and it's got, it's got, here's a vertex, it's got some in neighbors and it's got some out neighbors. And here's a tournament, if A and B have the Erdos Heinel property. So does this graph, this tournament. We, you substitute this tournament for that vertex. You take all of A except for that vertex. You take all of B and put edges out here and edges in there. Just substitution. And the same proof works. So it's not very really surprising. But all right, so we can do all these little cases all over again um, and see what you get. Well, once again, it peters out on sort of, you, you can prove it for graphs on four vertices, you can prove it for some graphs on five vertices, and you basically can't prove it for any graphs on six vertices except for what you can get by substitution. So not so much different, a little bit different, but not much different. Um, but there's a nice, there's a nice way to reformulate the again the uh, Erdos Heinel conjecture. So here's yet another, an equivalent to the Erdos Heinel conjecture. That for every tournament H, there exists. Uh, let me say C and delta, I won't use epsilon, such that every tournament C not containing H satisfies its chromatic number. Well, before, before we were saying this, the biggest acyclic subgraph is big, now we're going to say the chromatic number is small. And that's equivalent satisfies the chromatic number is at most the number of vertices raised to the power delta. So another point is that delta is less than one. Before we had that epsilon bigger than zero. And actually, this is equivalent. You just take delta to be one minus epsilon. If, if H used to satisfy the conjecture, if H satisfies this conjecture, you just write delta is one minus epsilon, and then it satisfies that conjecture. So really, they're just reformulation. And the, the argument is, is, suppose I know that it satisfies that conjecture, and I want to prove it satisfies this one. Well, here's my big tournament not containing H. It should contain a big transitive subset. Here it is. Size at least, whatever that was. C, N to the epsilon. And now you delete that and do it again. You get another set of size, C, nearly N to the epsilon, and you keep repeating until you got rid of about half the vertices, and then 
and see how much that costs you. And you, could just, you can just compute it. And you just keep pulling out greedily big acyclic subgraphs and it gives you a coloring. Um, well, okay, that doesn't seem much different. Except here's a curious thing that happens for tournaments, that sometimes delta equals one. No, delta equals zero. Sometimes you can take delta equals zero. That never happens for graphs. And what would that mean for a graph? Well, I don't even know what, what we, well, if, we, if coloring means coloring for graphs, then what would we be asking? We'd be saying all graphs that don't contain this little graph as an induced subgraph should have bounded chromatic number. Well, it's true if you exclude a one vertex graph. Uh, it's true if you exclude an edge, at a, t a K2. And it's not true for anything else. You know, a big clique won't contain, no. If you try to exclude something that has a non-edge, then a big clique is a counterexample. It has a big chromatic number and it doesn't contain your graph. If you try to exclude a little clique, in particular if you try to exclude a triangle, well, you can make graphs with big chromatic number that don't contain triangles. So that's false as well. So for graphs, this never, work, this never happens except for a one vertex graph or key two. And even if, you're, even if you're kind to graphs and use Brian's definition, what do you call it, the di, di something, dichromatic number? Where you color each, you partition the vertices and cliques and stable sets? Co-chromatic number, um, which, is a, which is sensible since, you're, since you're, what you really want is either a big clique or a big stable set. Um, even if you redefine coloring to mean that, it still doesn't work. Still the only graphs which it works are the one vertex graph and, and the two vertex graphs. So now two vertex graphs with an edge and two vertex graphs with a non-edge, but still nothing else works. So it's really not interesting for graphs, but for tournaments it is interesting, and that's what, I, that's what this talks about. Th this works sometimes. Which tournaments does it work for? Let's say, let's say uh, a tournament H. Is a hero if there exists a constant such that every tournament not containing H satisfies chromatic number is at most C. No, there are such things. So, for instance, here's, a very, here's an easy one. You take that. Tournaments not containing that, well, they're acyclic. So, okay, that's a start. We got to three vertex graphs. For the undirected version, we only got to two vertex graphs. So, we're a little bit further. But actually, there are a lot of them. So, for instance, let me prove the following. Let me prove that if, if H is a hero, then so is this graph. Here's H, and you add another vertex joined to everything. Let me prove that. Because... Let's call this H plus. Here's the proof. Take a tournament that does not contain H plus. So here's a tournament G, T, that does not contain H plus. Now we can assume it does contain H or else its chromatic number is bounded. Or I have to, I have to prove its chromatic number is bounded. Right? If it doesn't contain H, then its chromatic number is bounded. So we can assume at least it contains H. Here's a copy of H. Now, there's nobody, look at any other vertex. It's adjacent to or from, you know, for that vertex, there's an edge between that vertex and this one, 
one way or the other. I don't know if it goes, which way it goes. But there's nobody out here joined to all of these. Right? You never get a verdict like that, because that would give me H+. plus. So everybody outside is joined from at least one vertex of H. So let me write down the people that are joined from this vertex. And there are people that are joined from that vertex, and the people joined from this vertex, and so on. Right? And these sets together will have union everyone. Now, this does not contain H. Because if it did, you add that vertex to it, and it gives you H+. plus, right? And still, the arrows are going the right way. Right? So what did we just prove? That uh, if C works for H, then, well, what are we getting? This, each of these pieces don't contain H, so that's, has, that's called chromatic number C, and so is that, and so is that. We're going to get V of H times C. So if excluding H gives you chromatic number C, then excluding H plus gives you chromatic number C times the size of H. So it's still a hero. Um, so, okay, so now we've got at least infinitely many graphs with this problem. And we want to know what are they? I mean, do all graphs have this problem? What's something that's not a hero? I mean, for instance, what about this graph? If I draw all these arrows from left to right. Is that a hero? Yes, it is, because you can build it just by that operation. You keep on adding on, adding on sources. What if I do, say, that? Is that a hero? Don't know. I mean, we do know, but you don't know yet. Um, <laughs> So let me show you a reason why not, because, because uh, you can prove the following. Suppose, let me give you a, a class of graphs whose chromatic number is big. So I'll start with a, a single vertex. And now step two, so step one is a single vertex. Step two is I take, let's call this, I don't know, T1. T2 is I take, I take a single vertex and two copies of T1. All these edges go that way, and all these edges go that way, and all these edges go that way. Well, that's just a triangle. Now, step three is I take a single vertex and two copies of T2. All these edges go that way, all these edges go that way, all these edges go that way, and so on. Now, what's happening to the chromatic number? I claim at every stage the chromatic number goes up by one. I claim the chromatic number of Ti is at least i. Because it's true at the start. What happens? Let's see. Suppose it's true for i, and let's prove it for i plus one. So let's look at ti plus one. It looks like this. There's a copy of ti and a copy of ti. All these edges go there, and these go there, and these go there. Suppose you could still color it with the same number of colors. Suppose you didn't need one extra color. Well, that means in here you've got to, you've got to use all the colors because already this part needs whatever number of colors it was. Also, all the colors have to appear there, and one color has to appear up here. And then I have a, a cyclic triangle all in one color. Whatever color this is, that color also appears here, and it also appears there, so it makes a cyclic triangle. And, and yet each color is meant to be acyclic. So the chromatic numbers increase. So whenever you have a hero, that hero has to be a subgraph of one of these things. You know, if you have a hero, then the graphs that don't contain it are supposed to have bounded chromatic number. These guys don't have bounded chromatic number, so they must eventually contain it. Well, let's look at the first time you contain it. Let's look at the first time you contain it. Say Ti, ti plus 1 contains it, but Ti does not. Suppose, so I'm proving a theorem now. I'm proving if H is a strongly connected hero. Strongly connected hero. Then 
age admits uh, trisection. So partition of the vertices into three sets that look like this. Where all three sets are non-empty. That's a singleton. This is non-empty and this is non-empty. And the argument is, look at the first time ti plus 1 contains your hero. So here, the, the hero exists in here somewhere. It doesn't exist in this part, and it does not exist over there, and it's not just a single vertex. So it's got to meet at least two of the parts. And it's strongly connected, so it has to meet all three parts. So it must contain this, and it must contain some of that, and it must contain some of that. So the first time your hero appears, it looks like that. Now you, you look, that gives me the partition I wanted of the hero. Right, so that's, that's why every hero has to admit a trisection like this. And this guy does not. Doesn't admit any such trisection. So that proves this is not a hero. Um, well, what else can we do? What else can we... How else can we pin them down? There's a, there's a one particular graph that was a, a bit awkward. This one. You make this complete to there, this complete to that, and all of these complete to that. That graph. So a cyclic triangle, another cyclic triangle, and you join them up like that. Is this thing a hero? Well, it does admit the trisection I just said. So I can't rule it out on these grounds. But, in fact, it's not. What's the time? Uh, uh, okay, so we could prove this. Let me prove it very briefly. I'll, I'll sketch it. You can make a graph with big girth and big chromatic number. Take a graph with big girth, girth at least the size of, okay, I'm going to prove that every hero is too colorable. And this thing's not, not too colorable, so therefore this thing's not a hero. Um, because let H, let H be a hero. Take a, take a graph with girth bigger than the size of H and big dramatic number. Bigger than whatever the whatever this is going to give me. And what are its vertices? So here are the vertices of G. Now I want to construct a tournament out of that. Make a tournament that'll have the same vertex set. It's the construction of the boy mission. Whenever there's an edge, you put in a forward edge. And whenever there's a non edge, you put in a backward edge. Right? So from a graph and an ordering of the vertices, you can construct a tournament. And you can prove that this tournament also has a big chromatic number. So it uh, takes a couple of lines to prove, but it's still true. This tournament still has a big chromatic number. And yet it doesn't contain H. Well, so, therefore it does contain H if H is a hero. How can it contain H? Look at the subset on which it contains H. The, the set of edges that go forward, the set of edges going forward correspond to edges up there. There's no cycle of them because no cycle in G has length the size of H. So, if I look at the, the subset on which supposedly I contain my graph H, inside that subset, the forward edges don't include a cycle. And that means you can two-color them. You can two-color the vertices so that neither set includes a forward edge. And that means the hero itself is two-colorable. Um, okay, so that's another, another odd fact about heroes. The reason we're proving all these facts about heroes is that's the complete list. I've now told you two facts about heroes. I've proved that any strongly connected hero admits a trisection like this, and I've proved that thing's not a hero. And it turns out that's the answer to the question, which graphs are heroes? 
any tournament that satisfies, those, that satisfies these two theorems is a theorem. That's one way to stay, say our theorem. That uh, these are the only, anything that's not a hero, you can prove it's not a hero because of these two facts. Well, so we're not doing very well yet at constructing heroes. We have this one fact that if you have a hero, you can add a sink, and similarly, you can add a source. What about more complicated things? Um, Eventually, oh, by the way, this is joint work with a whole lot of people. We were, Maria and I were, were working on this, and we went around and talked to a whole lot of different people, and different people contributed different bits. And uh, it's joint with, let me see if I can remember. So, with Ellie Berger, uh, Maria, um, okay, that's two, there's, a, there's many more. Uh, uh, Kormansky, which I may not even be able to spell, but I think that's right. Uh, um, okay, F Jacob Fox, um, Scott, Scott Thomas, I'm trying to do them in alphabetical order. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lerbel, Martin Lerbel, Alex Scott. Stephen Thomasy and it's the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, that's right. And then well so what else can you do? How else can you make bigger heroes from smaller ones? You can do the following. If here's a hero you can add, we know we already you can add a vertex join from everything, and you can add a vertex join to everything. But so, uh, if you just obey that rule, then this edge would go upward, right? Which, if you add that vertex first and then add this vertex, you end up with that thing. But it's also true if you put this edge downward. And that's interesting because it makes a strongly connected hero, a bigger strongly connected hero. Um, and I just sketched the proof, but I think I can't. So, if H is a hero, so is this. Um, so that's something. And then we were stuck there for about a year. We knew all these facts, and we couldn't get any further between these. We had some proofs that some things were not heroes, Proves that some things were heroes, and we couldn't actually bring the two together. And so uh, uh, Martin Lerbel and Stephen Thomas, they suddenly proved a very nice result that kind of solved all the rest of the problem, basically. There was the following, that this graph is a hero. So two cyclic triangles, one joined to the other. Um, and I maybe, I don't know, I would like to show you the proof again, because it's really neat. I mean, it, we, it, it's important to, to us, because we spent so many months trying to prove this fact. I mean, maybe it wouldn't be so important to you. It seems, you know, it's, it takes five minutes to prove, and it's just a little calculation. But it really eluded us for a long time. Uh, maybe I'll skip it. But, uh, but, uh, but that was a big step that, uh, that uh, Thomas A. and Lowell came up with. And more generally, we were, we were then able to adapt their proof to show uh, H is a hero if and only if all its strong components are heroes. Um, and and we were also able to adapt this proof to say, not that, but to say so is you add a vertex join from, to everything and you would add a transitive set join from everything. Well, this is transitive. So this bit is what it was before. So this, part, this is going to be H. This part is H. 
I'm adding a vertex complete to H and a transitive set complete from H and all these edges go that way. And so that seems a little bit further than that. But actually that fills the gap now. Let's see. Now, so that completely constructs all heroes. That's the answer. Because suppose here's, a, here's something I would like to know is a, it's a hero. I would like to know how to construct it. If it's not strongly connected, I can cons I've explained it because of this theorem. I only have to understand the strongly connected heroes. If it is strongly connected, by this theorem it's got to have a trisection. By this theorem, not both of these have triangles, have cyclic triangles, because that thing's not a hero. And this, any subgraph of a hero is another hero. So not both of these can have triangles. One of these is transitive. And that means the thing is built by this construction starting from a smaller thing. So now our two sides have come together. We've, we've answered the question. Um, I'm sorry I didn't do any proofs, but, uh, but never mind. Um, let me, there was a, we, had a, we had a new result on the plane coming over here that I wanted to tell you about, because uh, let, me, let me take another two minutes to finish it off. So, this all came out of Verdish Heinel, and we've, we've modified it, asking for what's the, instead of asking for a big transitive set, we're asking for a small chromatic number. That's, that's the same if you're looking if you're looking for a set of size VG to the epsilon, where epsilon's bigger than zero. So alpha, you can ask that's true, you can ask chromatic number is at most VG to the one minus epsilon. These are, with constants in the front, these are equivalent. They're not actually, it's not so easy to see that they're equivalent when alpha, when epsilon is, when epsilon is zero. When epsilon is zero, it's not so clear that these are equivalent. Right? The obvious proof doesn't work for epsilon equals zero. In fact, they're still, they are still equivalent, but, uh, but we, it not, it's not at all obvious. So for which graphs H is, is it true? Uh, does there exist a C? such that every tournament G T not containing H satisfies it, it has a big state of set, big transitive set. At least the size divided by C. That's a little weaker than saying the chromatic numbers of most C. You know? If the chromatic numbers of most C, then you get a big transitive set. What if we just ask you get a big transitive set? When does there exist a constant such that you always get a linear size transitive set? Uh, not H, T. When is that true? In fact, it's exactly the same class of graphs. It's not so, it's not obvious, but uh, it all boils down to one particular graph, this one. Two vertices and two vertices and two vertices. And we had a lot of trouble proving that that thing was not a hero. It was not, did not have this property. We know it's not a hero, but we had a lot of trouble proving it doesn't have this property. In fact, we did with a probabilistic argument. I, you can tell I was desperate if I used a probabilistic argument. There are, I think there are no other papers by me with probabilistic arguments in. But, uh, but uh, so what does this give you if you exclude this? It does not give you a linear sized transitive set, but we, it seemed we could prove, so, I mean, if it satisfies Irish Heinel at all, it should give you, you know, can't see n to the epsilon for some epsilon, a transitive set of size c n to the epsilon for some epsilon bigger than zero. And it seems, it, we proved on the plane, it gives you c n epsilon for all epsilon less than one. Every epsilon less than one works. In fact, what it really gives you is CN over log n. Actually, CN over log square n. It gives you, there's always a transitive set of size constant times the number of vertices divided by log n square, which is really big. But it's not quite big enough to be linear. That's the only tournament 
No, it's not true it's the only term of this property, but it's the smallest one. All others included. Anyway, okay, good. I'll stop there. Thanks very much.